Hello everyone, in this video we are going to discuss how skeletal animation works since that's something that I've been adding to my game engine lately. Skeletal animation is basically the code and math that allows us to take a static character, like Digital Thomas for example, and make it move. Make it do things like walking, running, jumping or whatever other animation you might come up with. Since there's quite a lot of math involved in this, it's important to get every little detail right. Because if you don't, you might end up with things like this, 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 or this. Not exactly what we want. Anyways, this video is going to be divided in three parts and the timestamps will be below. First of all, we'll have a look at the generic concepts behind skeletal animation and if you're a 3D artist you will probably already be familiar with them. Then we'll have a look at all of the math, transformations, matrix multiplications and all that fun stuff. And finally, we'll have a look at the code or at least my specific implementation of skeletal animation. With that being said, let's dive into it. As with quite a lot of things in computer science, we tend to steal from the real world or from nature. For example, with artificial intelligence and neural networks, we take how the human brain works and we mimic that in a computer. And with skeletal animation, we look at how human or animal skeletons work and we try to mimic that in a computer. A skeleton contains a bunch of bones, for example, we've got the upper arm and lower arm, and in between them there's a joint where these two bones can move. Well, technically there's two bones in our lower arm, but in games we don't really care. Fun fact though, in movies they often model all of the bones and all of the muscles, and then they simulate how these muscles contract, which gives quite accurate uh, muscle movement beneath the skin of characters, and they often, they often apply this um, to animals. For example, the latest live-action Jungle Book movie did it, and I'm quite sure a lot of other movies do it as well. And someday we'll have that same technology in video games. But for now, we only care about a somewhat generic skeleton. What does that look like, you might ask? Well, let's take a look. As an example, I'll use Digital Thomas, and this is what his skeleton looks like. You should think of this as a tree or hierarchy of bones, and to make this a bit more concrete, I'll visualize some of these bones on the skeleton itself. Each bone has exactly one parent. For example, the lower arm has one parent, that being the upper arm. There's one exception to this rule, and that is the root bone, which of course has no parent whatsoever. Each bone also has one or more children. For example, the upper arm has one child bone, which is the lower arm, but each hand has five children, one for each finger. Usually, bones are connected to each other, however, notice that this does not always have to be the case. For example, the shoulders are not connected to the third spine bone, and the legs are not connected to the hip bone. When we now rotate one of these bones, all the child bones will rotate with it. For example, if we rotate the right upper arm by 30 degrees, the lower arm and hand and all the fingers will move with it. Now, this 30 degree rotation is obviously relative to the original pose of our model. We also refer to this as the rest pose or bind pose of the model. And every single animation is relative to it. Of course, we're not limited to 30 degree rotations only. We can do much more advanced things to craft this final pose. Theoretically, you could also scale and move these bones but I'm sure you can imagine that wouldn't look very good on human models. Now, an animation is nothing more than a bunch of these animated poses very quickly after one another. And actually, you might want to interpolate between these poses, but that's something that is way beyond the point of this video. And that someday, once my animation system has a bit matured, we will probably come back to that. Now there's one last detail we've missed out on. We've defined how all of these bones look like, what they look like, and how they can move and rotate, but we actually haven't told the computer how the 3D model should move based on that skeleton, because that's what skeletal animation is all about. And the way we do that is using weight painting, where we assign a weight 
to every single vertex and that weight determines how much a specific bone influences that vertex. Let's have a look at an example. This is what the weight paint for the hip bone would look like. Everywhere where it's blue there is no influence of that hip bone whatsoever. When it's red the hip bone has full influence over that part of the 3D model and yellow means it has half influence and then every color in between is obviously some kind of influence in between so this allows us to gradually go from full influence to no influence at all. Of course I said we had to do that for every single bone so here's what that looks like for a few more bones. Now it's time to dive into all of the fun math. It would be great if you've got somewhat of an understanding of vectors and matrices and if you don't I actually made videos discussing both of them. If you don't, don't worry, here's a quick recap. You should think of a vector as a point in space that is described by an x, y and z component. And a matrix is, for our intents and purposes, just a magical number grid that describes a transformation, that is a translation, rotation and scaling. When you multiply a vector with a matrix that describes a translation of, let's say, move three steps to the left, then the result of that will be a new vector that has moved, well, you guessed it, three steps to the left. Now that we know all of that, let's do a deep dive into some math. In our 3D software, in my case Blender, we define these bones using two points, or two three-dimensional positions. However, mathematically, it would be a bit more correct to think of it as one point in space and a vector that gives the direction of that bone. Notice that this vector doesn't necessarily have a length, a normalized vector is more than enough to show what orientation the bone should have. Now from this we can calculate a matrix that describes this bone's transformation and lucky for us Blender just provides that and what it looks like would be something like this. We refer to this as the model matrix which defines the transformation of that bone relative to the model's origin. In just a moment we'll also need the inverse model matrix which is basically the exact same transformation but inverted. It defines how to move that bone to the model's origin. But perhaps the most important matrix is the local matrix which defines a transformation of a bone relative to its parent. So for the hip bone, that matrix describes this transformation, and for the left shoulder, that matrix describes this transformation. Now, from these local matrices, we can also calculate the model matrices of a bone. We simply do that by pre-multiplying with the entire parent hierarchy. So for the hip bone, since there's only one parent, we just have to pre-multiply it with the root bone's local matrix. And for the left shoulder, it gets a bit more involved. Once again, we just follow the hierarchy down, so we first pre-multiply with the third spine bone, then the second spine bone, the first spine bone, the hips, all the way to the root, which then once again gives us the model matrix of that left shoulder. Now, all these matrices are great and everything, but when it comes to an animated pose, for example this 30 degree rotation of the right upper arm, what we are ultimately interested in is a transformation or matrix that describes how to move from the original position of the bone or the original position of the model to the animated position. And the way we can calculate that is using two matrices. First of all, the inverse model matrix in this case of the hand bone and of course our 3D modeling software provide that to us and second of all the model matrix of that hand bone after the animation. So how do we calculate all of this? Well the model matrix of the hand bone after the animation would be equal to the animated model matrix of the parent bone which in this case would be the animated model matrix of the lower right arm. We multiply that with the local matrix of the hand, which once again was provided by Blender. And then finally we multiply that by the animation matrix of the hand. This animation matrix changes every single frame, so the model moves, and it was of course relative to the parent bone in its untransformed position. Then from this we can calculate the final matrix 
by multiplying the animated model matrix of the hand with the original inverse model matrix of the hand. And now it's this final matrix that describes how to go from the original untransformed bones transformation to the animated or transformed bone transformation. And now it's this final matrix which we will send to the shader to actually move the 3D model itself because up until now we've only calculated how the bones should move to their animated location. With our knowledge on math somewhat completed, it is time to start programming. But before we do that, we first have to discuss how we lay out all of this data in memory, which is something that is, as a game developer, rather important. And as a C++ developer, I also really worry about my data layout in memory. The reason why it's so important is because a good data layout in memory, which usually means things you access sequentially are next to each other in memory, the advantage of that is that you'll have cache coherency and cache coherency usually brings speed or more speed to your program than when things are not cache coherent. And we'll talk about cache coherency and cache misses and optimization in a future video because it's quite an interesting topic. With that being said, let's take a look at how all of this data is arranged in memory. First of all, we'll give each bone a number from zero to however many bones there are. But of course, this number doesn't really need to get stored. It's just an index into a list of bones. Second of all, we do not really need to know the name of the bone. What we do need to know, though, is the parent of each bone, since we need that for our matrix multiplications. One way to cleverly store them is by just storing the parent index of each bone. And here I'll swap out the name of a bone with the index of its parent. Of course, we don't need to store this in a hierarchy either. We can just store it in a linear array. Important to note here is that this array is sorted such that the parent of a bone will always appear before any of its children. Finally, we also need a local matrix for every single bone, as well as an inverse model matrix for every single bone. And these three pieces of data, the parent index, the local matrix and inverse model matrix are all exported from a 3D package, in my case, Blender. Of course, we also need to store the weight pane data, and we just do that by assigning two extra vertex attributes to every single vertex that makes up the 3D model. We'll store four bone indices, which are just an index into that array of bones, and four bone weights, which are the appropriate weights for every single bone that influences this vertex. Those weights are the blue, yellow or red colors we saw earlier and did just a number between 0 and 1. Important here is that the weight of all the bones that influence a single vertex need to sum up to 1. Otherwise you might end up with strange results. Now with all of this knowledge and the math knowledge that we've got earlier, it is time to look at some code. Notice that I did simplify some things for educational purposes, but you can use the code I'm about to show you in your game engine and it should just work fine as long as you do everything correctly. This is the piece of code that will calculate the final matrices which we send to the shader. We have a function calculate animation pose which takes in three parameters. First of all a list of bones and once again each bone just contains a parent index, an inverse model matrix and a local matrix. In matrices are the matrices that describe the animation transform and these change every single frame to get our animated model. And out matrices are the matrices we send to the shader. Then we'll create two intermediary arrays one for local transforms and one for model transforms. These arrays are the same size as the amount of bones we've got and they will store the local and model transform after the animation is applied. Then we'll loop over all of the bones and we'll multiply the local matrix of a bone with the in matrices which once again contain the animation for that specific bone and we'll store the result in the local transform array. Then we have this piece of code which handles a special case that the model transform of the first bone or the root bone is equal to the local transform of that first bone or root bone. 
simply because it doesn't have any parent. Then we loop over all of the bones, but starting at index one, because we already set the model transform for that root bone. Then we'll get the parent index from our bone array, and then we'll calculate the model transform of that specific bone by looking up the model transform of that specific parent and multiplying with the local transform of the bone we're currently at. Notice that this logic where we can multiply with a model transform of a specific parent only works because parents are guaranteed to appear in front of any of their children in these arrays. If that's not the case, this code will not work since that specific model transform wouldn't have been calculated by the time we need it. Finally, we'll loop over all of the bones one last time to multiply the model transform of a bone with its inverse model matrix and we'll store that result in the out matrices array, which we'll then send to the shader code. That shader code looks something like this. We've got a function called skinning and it takes in P and N. P is the position of a vertex and N the normal of a vertex. You can also see I declared them as in out, so we'll read the current position and write the moved or transformed position back to that same variable. The function also takes in four weights and four appropriate bone indices. Then we'll check if any of the weights is bigger than zero, because if that's not the case, this vertex is not weighted and we don't have to transform it at all. Then we'll create a 3x4 matrix and set it equal to zero. A 3x4 matrix is basically a 4x4 matrix without the bottom row. The reason why we don't need that bottom row is because it only stores perspective information and of course we don't want to do any perspective transforms on bones. Then we'll loop four times for every single one of the weights and indices. Bones is an array which contains the matrices we calculated earlier in the C++ code. We'll then index into this bones array by taking one of the indices that was assigned to this vertex, and then we'll multiply that with the appropriate weight. And now we add that onto our temporary matrix. We do that once again four times for every single bone that might influence this vertex. And it would be very rare to have more than four bone influences per vertex. So you might have been wondering whether that's a problem. Well, it's not. Once again, as long as the weights are normalized, so their sum adds up to one. Then it's time to actually transform the position and normal of our vertex by multiplying with the matrix we just calculated. In terms of that position, we have to turn it into a four-dimensional vector with a W component set equal to one. I discussed that in my videos talking about matrices, which I highly recommend you go check out to get a bit more detail on all of this. And then we also multiply our normal with the matrix we just calculated. But as you can see, we first truncate that to a three by three matrix, since we don't want to translate our normal. Finally, here's a piece of Python code that takes all of the bones, parent indices, local matrices, and inverse model matrices from Blender and stores them to a file. I've got a similar function or similar piece of code to export all of the animation matrices for every single frame of an animation. And I've also got a similar piece of code to export a 3D model. I discussed this in some detail last video. With all this knowledge, you are now ready to implement skeletal animation into your own game engine, or you've just become a bit wiser if you don't really want to implement it in a game engine. Next time, we're going to look at 2D and Android. If you want to know what that's all about, then make sure you subscribe to the channel. Do not miss that video. And with that being said, I'll see you all next time. Goodbye.